Reading through the Book of Concord, a reader's edition in one year, 52 sessions, each one lasting approximately 20 minutes. Session one, or week one, will be the Creeds and Luther's Small Catechism. Again, this is Concordia Publishing House's reader's edition of the Book of Concord, reading through it in one year, 52 sessions, each week or each session is broken down into five parts. Beginning week one, session one, with the three universal creeds. The first universal creed is the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Nicene Creed I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Creed of Athanasius, written against the Arians. The Athanasian Creed. Whoever desires to be saved, above all, must hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the person nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty. And yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three Lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made nor created nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, 
one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again on the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Day 1 completed. Day 2. The Preface of Dr. Martin Luther. Martin Luther to all faithful and godly pastors and preachers. Grace, mercy, and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. The deplorable, miserable condition that I discovered recently, when I too was a visitor, has forced and urged me to prepare this small catechism of or Christian doctrine. In this small, plain, and simple form, mercy, dear God, what great misery I beheld, the common person, especially in the villages, has no knowledge whatever of Christian doctrine, and unfortunately many pastors are completely unable and unqualified to teach. This is so much so that one is ashamed to speak of it. Yet everyone says that they are Christians, have been baptized, and received the holy sacraments, even though they cannot even recite the Lord's Prayer, or the Creed, or the Ten Commandments, they live like dumb brutes and irrational hogs. Now that the gospel has come, they have nicely learned to abuse all freedom, just like experts. O oh, bishops, what answer will you ever give to Christ for having so shamefully neglected the people and never for a moment fulfilled your office? James 3.1 May all misfortune run from you. I do not wish at this at this place to call down evil on your heads. You command the sacrament in one form and insist on your human laws, and yet at the same time you do not care at all whether the people know the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments, or any part of God's Word. Woe, woe to you forever. See Matthew 23. Therefore I beg you, all for God's sake, my dear sirs and brethren, you are pastors, who are pastors or preachers, to devote yourselves heartily to your office. 1 Timothy 4.13 Have pity on the people who are entrusted to you. Acts 20.28 20, And help us teach the catechism to the people, and especially to the young. And let those of you who cannot do better take these tables and forms and impress them word for word on the people. Deuteronomy 6.7 as follows. In the first place, let the preacher above all 
be careful to avoid many versions or various texts and forms of the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Sacraments, and such. He should choose one form to which he holds and teaches all the time, year after year, for young and simple people must be taught by uniform, settled texts and forms. Otherwise, they become confused easily when the teacher today teaches them one way in a year some other way, as if he wished to make improvements. For then all effort and labor that had been spent on teaching is lost. Our blessed fathers understood this well also. They all used the same form of the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. Therefore, we too should be at pains to teach the young and simple people these parts in such a way that we do not change a syllable or set them forth and repeat them one year differently than in another. Therefore, choose whatever form you please and hold to it forever. But when you preach in the presence of learned and intelligent people, you may show your skill. You may present these parts in varied and tr intricate ways and give them as masterly turns as you are able. But would the young people stick to one fixed permanent form and manner? Teach them first of all these parts, the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and so on, according to the text, word for word, so that they, too, can repeat it in the same way after you and commit it to memory. But those who are unwilling to learn the Catechism should be told that they deny Christ and are not Christians. They should not be admitted to the sacrament, accepted as sponsors at baptism, or practice any part of Christian freedom. They should simply be turned back to the Pope and his officials, indeed, to the devil himself, 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. Furthermore, their parents and employers should refuse them food and drink and notify them that the prince will drive such rude people from the country. Although we cannot and should not force anyone to believe, we should insist and encourage the people. That way they will know what is right and wrong for those among whom they dwell and wish it to make, to make their living. For whoever desires to live in a town must know and observe the town laws, because he wishes to enjoy the protection offered by the laws, whether he is a believer or at heart in and in private a rascal or rogue. In the second place, after they have learned the text well, teach them the meaning also, so that they know what it means. Again, choose the form of these tables or some other brief uniform method, whichever you like, and hold to it. Do not change a single syllable, as was just said about the text. Take your time in doing this, for it is not necessary for you to explain all the parts at once but one after the other. After they understand the first commandment, well, then explain the second, and so on. Otherwise, they will be overwhelmed, so that they will not be able to remember anything well. In the third place, after you have taught them this short catechism, then take up the large catechism, and give them also a richer and fuller knowledge. Here enlarge upon every, here enlarge upon every commandment, article, petition, and part, with its various works, uses, benefits, dangers, and injuries, as you find these abundantly stated in many books written about these matters. In particular, urge the commandment or part the, that most suffers the greatest neglect among your people. For example, the seventh commandment about stealing must be strongly urged among mechanics and merchants and even farmers and servants. For among these people many kinds of dishonesty and stealing prevail. So too, you must drive home the fourth commandment amongst the children and the common people so that they may be quiet and faithful, obedient and peaceable. You must always offer many examples from the scriptures to show how God has punished or blessed such persons. Deuteronomy 28. In this matter, you should especially urge magistrates and parents to rule well, and to send their children to school. <clears throat> Show them why it is their duty to do this, and what a damnable sin that they are committing if they do not do it. For by such neglect they overthrow and destroy both God's kingdom and that of the world. They act as if the worst enemies, both of God and of people, make it very plain to them what an awful harm they are doing 
if they will not help to train children to be pastors, preachers, clerks, and to fill other offices that we cannot do without in this life. God will punish them terribly for this failure. There is a great need to preach this. In this matter, parents and rulers are now sinning in unspeakable ways. The devil, too, hopes to accomplish something cruel because of these things. Last, since the tyranny of the Pope has been abolished, people are no longer willing to go to the sacrament, and thus they despise it. Here again, encouragement is necessary, yet with this understanding, we are to force no one to believe or to receive the sacrament, nor should we set up any law, time, or place for it. Instead, preach in such a way that by their own will, without law, they will urge themselves, as it were, compel us pastors to administer the sacrament. This is done by telling them, when someone does not seek or desire the sacrament at least four times a year, it is to be feared that he despises the sacrament and is not a Christian. Just as a person is not a Christian who does not believe or hear the gospel. For Christ did not say, leave this out or despise this, but do this as often as you drink it. 1 Corinthians 11.25 In other such words, Truly, he wants it done and not entirely neglected and despised. Do this, he says. Now, whoever does not highly value the sacrament shows that he has no sin, no flesh, no devil, no world, no death, no danger, no hell. In other words, he does not believe any such things, although he is in them, up over his head and his ears, and is doubly the devil's own. On the other hand, he needs no grace, no life, no paradise, no heaven, no Christ, no God, nor anything good. For if he believed that he had so much evil around him and needed so much that is good, he would not neglect the sacrament by which such evil is remedied and so much good is bestowed. Nor would it be necessary to force him to go to the sacrament by any law. He would come running and racing of his own will would force himself and beg that you must give him the sacrament. Therefore you must not make any law about this as the Pope does. Only set forth clearly the benefit and harm, the need and use, the danger and the blessing connected with this sacrament. Then the people will come on their own without you forcing them. But if they do not come, let them go their way and tell them that such people belong to the devil who do not regard nor feel their great need and God's gracious help. But if you do not urge this, or make a law, or make it bitter, it is your fault if they despise the sacrament. What else could they be than lazy if you sleep and are silent? Therefore, look to it, pastors and preachers. Our office has now become a different thing from what it was under the Pope. It has now become a serious and saving office. So it now involves much more trouble and labor, danger, and trials. In addition, it gains little reward and thanks in the world. But Christ himself will be our reward if we labor faithfully. See Genesis 15.1 To this end, may the Father of all grace help us, to whom be praise and thanks forever. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The end of day two. Day 3. The Ten Commandments. As the head of the family, he should teach them in a simple way to his household. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. The second commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may not curse, swear, use witchcraft, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. The third commandment, you shall sanctify the holy day. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. The fourth commandment, you shall honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you, and you may live long upon the earth. What does this mean? 
We should fear and love God so that we may not despise or anger our parents and masters, but give them honor, serve them, obey them, and hold them in love and esteem. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and befriend him in every bodily need, in every need and danger of life and body. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may lead a pure and decent life in words and deeds and each love and honor his spouse. The seventh commandment, you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may not take our neighbor's money or property, nor get them with bad products or deals, but help him to improve and protect his property and business. The Eighth Commandment You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may not deceitfully belial, betray, slander, or defame our neighbor, but defend him, think, think and speak well of him, and put the best construction on everything. The Ninth Commandment You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may not craftily seek to get our neighbor's inheritance or house, or obtain it by show of justice and right or any other means, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. The Tenth Commandment You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservants, or his maidservants, or his cattle, or anything that is his. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we may not turn, force, or entice away our neighbor's wife, servants, or cattle, but urge them to stay and carefully to do their duty. What does God say about all of these commandments? Answer, God says, from Exodus 20, Verses 5 and 6. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Again, Exodus 20, 5 and 6. What does this mean? Answer, God threatens to punish all who sin against these commandments, therefore we should fear his wrath and not act contrary to these commandments. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. The Creed The first article of the Creed, Creation I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures. He has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my limbs, my reason and all my senses, and still preserves them. In addition, he has also given me clothing and shoes, meal and drink, house and home, wife and children, fields and cattle, and all my goods. He provides me richly and daily with all that I need to support this body and life. He protects me from all danger and guards me and preserves me from all evil. He does all this out of pure fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this I ought to thank him, praise him, serve him, and obey him. This is most certainly true. The second article of the Creed, Redemption. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil. And he did this not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, so that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, 
and blessedness. Just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. The third article, Sanctification. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way He calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, He daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day he will raise up me and all the dead and will give eternal life to me and to all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. The Lord's Prayer Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? By these words, God would tenderly encourage us to believe that He is our true Father and that we are His true children, so that we may ask Him confidently, with all assurance as dear children, ask their dear Father. The first petition, Hallowed be thy name. What does this mean? God's name is indeed holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may become holy among us also. And how is this done? When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we as the children of God also lead holy lives in accordance with it. To this end, help us, dear Father in heaven. But anyone who teaches and lives other than by what God's word teaches profanes the name of God among us. From this preserve us, Heavenly Father. The second petition, Thy kingdom come. What does this mean? The kingdom of God comes indeed without our prayers of itself, but we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. How is this done? When our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit so that by His grace we believe His Holy Word and lead a godly life here in time and there in eternity. The third petition, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does this mean? The good and gracious will of God is done indeed without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may be done among us also. And how is this done? When God breaks and hinders every evil counsel and will that would not let us hallow the name of God, nor let his kingdom come, such as the will of the devil, the world, and our flesh, instead he strengthens and keeps us steadfast in his word and in faith until we die. This is his gracious and good will. The fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? God gives daily bread even without our prayer to all wicked people. But we pray in this petition that he would lead us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. What is meant by daily bread? Everything that belongs to the support and needs of the body, such as food and drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, field, cattle, money, goods, a pious spouse, pious children and pious servants, pious and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, discipline, honor, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. The fifth petition, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What does this mean? We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look upon our sins nor deny such petitions on account of them. We are not worthy of any of the things for which we pray, neither have we deserved them. But we pray that he would grant them all to us by grace, for we daily sin much and indeed deserve nothing but punishment. So will we truly on our part also heartily forgive and readily do good to those who sin against us. The sixth petition, and lead us not into temptation. What does this mean?
God indeed tempts no one, but we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us, so that the devil, the world, and our flesh may not deceive us, nor seduce us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Though we are attacked by these things, we pray that still we may finally overcome them and gain victory. The seventh petition. But deliver us from the evil one. What does this mean? We pray in this petition as in summary that our Father in heaven would deliver us from all kinds of evil, evil of body and soul, property and home and honor. And finally, when our last hour shall come, we pray that he would grant us a blessed end and graciously take us from this veil of tears to himself in heaven. Amen. What does this mean? I should be certain that these petitions are acceptable to our Father in heaven and are heard by him, for he himself has commanded us to pray this way and has promised that he will hear us. Amen, amen. That is, yes, yes, it shall be so. Day four of the first week, the sacrament of holy baptism. As the head of the family, you shall teach in a simple way this to your household. First, what is baptism? Answer, baptism is not simple water only, but it is the water included in God's command and connected with God's word. Which is that word of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. Second, what does baptism give or profit? Answer, it works forgiveness of sins delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and the promises of God declare. Which are these words and promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Third, how can water do such great things? It is not the water indeed that does them, but the word of God, which is in and with the water, and faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without the word of God, the water is simply water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism, that is, a gracious water of life and a washing of regeneration in the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy. Verses 5 through 8. Fourth, what does such baptizing with water signify? It signifies that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil lust. And also it shows that a new man should daily come forth and arise, who shall live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Where is this written? St. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. How the unlearned should be taught to confess. What is confession? Confession has two parts. The one is that we confess our sins. The other is that we receive absolution or forgiveness from the confessor as from God himself and in no way doubt but firmly believe that our sins are forgiven before God in heaven by this. What sins should we confess? Before God we should plead guilty of all sins, even of those that we do not know as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the confessor we should confess only those sins that we know and feel in our hearts. Which are these? Here you consider your calling according to the Ten Commandments, whether you are a father, or a mother, or a son, or a daughter, or a master, or a mistress, a manservant, or a maidservant. 
consider whether you have been disobedient, unfaithful, or slothful. Consider whether you have grieved anyone by words or deeds, whether you have stolen, neglected, wasted, or done other harm. Please give to me a brief form of confession. The following is a brief form of confession that can be used for individual confession and absolution. You should speak to the confessor like this. Dear Reverend and dear Sir, I ask you to hear my confession and to pronounce forgiveness to me for God's sake. Proceed. I, a poor sinner, confess myself guilty of all sins before God and especially confess before you that I am a manservant, a maidservant, etc. But unfortunately I serve my master unfaithfully, for in this and in what I have not done, what has been commanded me, I have provoked him and caused him to curse. I have been neg negligent in many things and permitted damage to be done. I have also been immodest in words and deeds. I have argued with my equals, grumbled and sworn at my mistress, and so forth. For all this I am sorry, and I pray for grace, and I want to do better. A master or mistress may say this. In particular, I confess before you that I have not faithfully trained my children, or my domestic servant, and wife and family for God's glory. I have cursed, I have set a bad example by rude words or deeds. I have done my neighbor harm and spoken evil of him. I have overcharged, I have sold inferior products. I have given people less than they paid for, and whatever else he has done against God's command and his calling and such. But if anyone does not find himself burdened with these sins or greater sins, he should not trouble himself or search for or invent other sins and thereby make confession a, fo uh, a torture. He should mention one or two sins that he knows, say in particular, I confess that I once cursed, or further, I once used improper words, I have once neglected this or that, and so on. And let this be enough. But if you don't know of any sins at all, which, however, is hardly possible, then mention none in particular, but receive the forgiveness upon your general confession, that you make before God to the confessor. Then the confessor shall say, God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Furthermore, do you believe that my forgiveness is God's forgiveness? Answer, yes, dear sir. Then let him say, as you believe, so let it be done. And by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Depart in peace. But for those who have great burdens on their conscience, or are distressed and tempted, the confessor will know how to comfort and to encourage them to believe with more passages of Scripture. This is supposed to serve just as a general form of confession for the unlearned. And lastly, Article 6, the Sacrament of the Altar. What is the Sacrament of the Altar? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine for us Christians to eat and drink, instituted by Christ himself. Where is it written? The Holy Evangelist, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and St. Paul write, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. What is the benefit of such eating and drinking? Answer. That is shown us in these words, Given for you, and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This means that in the sacrament forgiveness of sins, life and salvation are given us through these words. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. How can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? Answer, it is not the eating and drinking, indeed, that does them, but the words which are given here, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. 
These words are, besides the bodily eating and drinking, the chief thing in the sacrament. The person who believes these words has what they say and express, namely, the forgiveness of sins. Who then receives such sacrament worthily? Answer. Fasting and bodily preparation are indeed fine outward training, but a person is truly worthy and well prepared who has faith in these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. But anyone who does not believe these words or doubts is unworthy and unfit, for the words for you require hearts that truly believe. Day 5 of the first week session of reading through the Book of Concord in one year is how the head of the family shall teach his family to pray. The last section of Luther's small catechism. The morning prayer. In the morning when you arise, you shall bless yourself with the Holy Cross and say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Then kneeling or standing, repeat the creed in the Lord's Prayer if you choose. You may in addition say this little prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, so that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Then go to your work with joy, singing a hymn like one on the Ten Commandments or what your devotion may suggest. The evening prayer. In the evening when you go to bed, you shall bless yourself with the Holy Cross and say, In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Then kneeling or standing, repeat the creed in the Lord's Prayer. If you choose, you may in addition say this little prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray, forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night, for into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. How the head of the family shall teach them to pray. Asking a blessing. The children and servants shall go to the table with folded hands reverently and say, The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Psalm 145, 15 and 16. Then say the Lord's Prayer and the following prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless us, and these your gifts, which we receive from your bountiful goodness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Likewise, after the meal, they shall reverently and with folded hands say, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. He gives to the beasts their food, and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Psalm 136, 1. Psalm 147, 9 through 11. Then say the Lord's Prayer and the following prayer. We thank you, Lord God, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for all your benefits, who lives and reigns forever. Amen. Certain passages in the table of duties of Scripture for various holy orders and positions by which these people are to be admonished as a special lesson about their office and service. For bishops, pastors, and preachers, therefore an overseer, pastor, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, 
so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. 1 Timothy 3, 2-4, and verse 6, Titus 1, 9. What the hearers owe to their pastors. In the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Galatians 6.6 6. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. 1 Timothy 5.17-18 and 18. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Hebrews 13, 17. Concerning civil government. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant, for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Romans 13, 1-4 What subjects owe to the rulers? Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Matthew twenty-two twenty-one. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Romans 13, verse 1, and verses 5 through 7. First of all, then, I urge the supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceable life, quiet and godly, dignified in every way. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Titus 3, 1. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14. For husbands, likewise husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. 1 Peter 3, 7 Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Colossians three nineteen. For wives, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For this is how the holy women who hoped, to God, you, who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Ephesians 5.22 and 1 Peter 3.5 and 6. For parents, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Ephesians 6.4. For children, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in this land. Ephesians 6, 1-3 For male and female servants, hired men and laborers, slaves obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to 